Amen. All right, let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning, and we thank you for that offering. Uh, we present it to you, our tithes and our offerings, our gifts, and we're so thankful for what you've done for us, that you've, uh, you've taken us out of eternal death and you've given us spiritual life. You have filled us with the Holy Ghost. You've uh, allowed him to dwell on the inside of us and to be our guide and our comforter, our paraclete in life. We are never without help. We are never without strength, courage, whatever we need. We have it on the inside of us. You made a way where there was no way. There was a wall between us, Father, but by the blood of Jesus, you brought peace unto us. And we're so thankful for that. So we present our tithes and our offerings to you this morning. And we thank you, Lord. We're giving you our 10%. We're giving you our offerings. And we're thanking you, Lord, that you are worthy of all of it. You're worthy of more, Father. And we thank you that as you increase us, as you put more seed in our hand, we will give it faithfully in the name of Jesus, being led by the Spirit. And uh, our giving will increase. And so will everything else in our life, Father. And so we thank you for this. And we thank you that we're on this journey and we're learning more about giving and about sowing and reaping and about the laws of increase. And so we just believe that we receive wisdom and revelation today by the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, speak in this place. And just thank you that every heart and mind is ready and open to receive. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 All right. Well, this morning, I, uh, I want to talk to you in line with this whole entire giving uh, message, uh, the laws of increase, so to speak. Uh, but the Lord just uh, entitled this message today, Is it a prosperity gospel or is it a poverty gospel? Is it a prosperity gospel or is it a poverty gospel? Uh, you know, people talk about it all the time here in South Florida, but it really it's going on across the nation. There's rising college costs, there's student loans and debts, you know, rising house costs, rising rent costs. Uh, it's difficult for younger people to purchase homes today than it was in other generations. Uh, Health care, retirement, debt. These are all mainstream problems and issues that everybody talks about. And really, our entire lives almost revolve around all of those things right now. Because if you don't have money, you really can't live on this earth. You know, you, you've, probably, uh, you've probably heard this. You know, answer, or the answer to a lot of people's problems is simply money. If they had more money, they'd do more. They'd be able to give more. They'd be able to bless more. Um, or, you know, as believers, we just need more favor from God. Um, but everyone could use a little bit more money. Amen. See? See? But when you start talking about money in church, the religious get offended and the doubters start talking and posting on Facebook because the world really believes and it's, a, it's been instigated and it's been planted by Satan in the world. Remember, you're not of the world. We might be living in this world, but we're not of the world. So the world hates it. I mean, the world hates it when Christians are healed and they're well, but the world hates it even more when Christians start talking about money and taking over the economy of nations. Because Satan understands that if Christians have money in their hand, we're not going to spend it on, on, on just the, the homes and the cars and the, my goodness, we're going to spend it on being generous and blessing communities and blessing people. We're going to demonstrate the love of God and the generosity and the hospitality of God to one another. And people will really be able to see Jesus at work on this earth. Because Jesus himself was a giver. He was generous. But the moment you start talking about money, people get all bent out of shape, especially when a preacher does. So last week, man, I, I, I got off the pulpit and I told my wife, I really enjoyed last week's message. You want to know why? Because I preached the word, I taught the word, I prayed the word, I sang the word so that you might believe the word and say the word. But more, more than that... I like, 
I like talking about this money issue because it instigates. It makes people really uncomfortable. And I just feel like that's what I was created to do as a minister of the gospel. Because our money, we don't realize that our money is so attached to our fellowship and our experience with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Ghost. Because God doesn't want you to trust in money. He wants you to trust in Him. God doesn't want you to trust in your possessions and your treasures and your 401 case. He wants you to trust completely in His kingdom economics. And when money has your heart, God does not. You cannot serve God and serve money. And when you start talking about money to Christians, they start leaving early. They start thinking, I'm not going to show up next week. But you see, that means this message is specifically, it was made and designed just for you. Because you're the type of person that needs it the most. Because what the Bible shows us is that God wants you to be well off. He does not want you to be below poverty, in poverty. He doesn't want one of your needs, desires, or wants to go unmet on this earth. But Satan has planted in the minds of people in this world, and even religion, traditional denominations, they believe that Christians are supposed to be poor and in debt and barely making it because somehow that brings honor to God. Because money is the root of all evil, right? No, it's loving money. That's right. I got a good response there. I like that. No, when you start loving money, I mean, you just get all messed up. You know, you start doing wrong things, thinking wrong things, being with wrong people. You start lusting after the wrong things. You get, you get away from God's plan and purpose for your life. But everyone seems to have a take on this prosperity gospel. There's even ministers that have come out and they didn't completely renounce the prosperity gospel, but they have renounced the certain gimmicks that have been involved in it. Because even the media will say that a prosperity gospel proves that, that what we teach is that if you give, God is going to give you back stuff. That's how you get your health and your wealth. They have part of it right, but they have a lot of it wrong as well. So your me the media cannot define, denominational ministers cannot define how you give your money, how you invest your money, how you become generous or lack thereof. Only the Bible, only Jesus himself can tell you how to, to spend your money, invest your money, what you do with your money. He's the only one that should be able to do that in your life. And we get it straight from what? The Bible. I'm tired of preachers preaching a half gospel when it comes to prosperity just because they need to build the bank account or they need to pay some bills. But then I'm also tired of these other people that are always criticizing the prosperity gospel because God just wants you to barely get by. They're both wrong. Jesus is very definitive about you being prosperous. And I want to find out about it. I want to, I want to see to it that you become prosperous. That you advance, that you increase, that all your needs are met. That not one thing is lacking in your life. That if you wanted to buy a new pair of shoes for your baby, you can, and you don't even have to worry about it. If you wanted to buy a new pair of shoes for somebody else, you don't even have to worry about it. Because the reason why, the primary reason why God wants us to be blessed is to be generous souls. 
so that you can dream, you can say, God, give me a dream of how I can just give to people, specifically your people. Let me answer people's prayers financially. Think about one day. Forget about one day. Forget it. just right now. Have you thought about the, the Lord? I'm going there. My, my, my wife and I, I told her, I said, okay, here's the deal. Nothing's off limits. Like if the Lord tells you to do something for somebody, bless somebody, be generous, do it. Just check in with me, please. Because I just want to hear from God from myself. <laughs> Just so that we're on the same page. Well, we both, we were, we had an opportunity to bless somebody. And uh, I could, she, she didn't even look at me. She didn't even like gra grab my leg or, or, or text me anything. Oh, she got the credit card out and she just went for it. She was like sneaky, stealth. She was like a stealth giver. But I, in my mind, I had it. I, I had it in my mind and my heart. I'm like, I want to I wanna bless these people. I want to bless them. And then the thought crossed my mind. It's not in your budget to bless them. And for a minute, I sat there and I thought, that's right. It's not in my budget to be a blessing. And then I thought a little bit more. I said, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like Jesus Why should I have any limits on my giving? Why should I have any boundaries on what I'm able or what I can't, you know, what I am unable to do based upon what's in my bank account? Why can't I just release what God tells me to release, even if it looks like I don't have enough in my bank account? You want to know why? Because there's fear, there's selfishness, and there's stinginess that has to be taken care of. And you know how you break that selfishness? You give. You give till it hurts. Because that's what Jesus did for us. He gave sacrificially. He gave selflessly. Until it hurt on a whipping post. With a cat of nine tails. 380 some odd stripes. Bones and nails and shrapnel. Ripping through his flesh. He gave his life for us. And he didn't even think twice about it. I mean, he did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, do I really have to do this? But he said, Lord, I want to do this because I know what's on the other side. So we have to break that stinginess. We have to break that selfishness because that's not God. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's not Jesus. That's not the love of God. We have to break that carnality that is in our thinking. That we don't have enough. That we're not going to get enough. You want to know why people hoard things? They don't believe they're ever going to get any more. That is a poverty mentality. God did not call you to hoard things. He called you to be generous, liberal. Look for opportunities to be a blessing and say, Lord, is this the mission that you have me on right now? Imagine buying somebody a car. Not for yourself, for somebody else. See, I like doing that. I could feel it right now. Some of you can't even imagine it. I could feel that in the spirit. But you can. You know what? You can ask the Holy Ghost, who can I give that, that needs help with their rent for, or, or their leasing for their car or for their car payment? You can give $25 towards it. You don't have to wait until you have all the money. You can start right where you are with what's in your hand. And you can say, God... Use me to love people. You are not limited by what's in your bank account. You're only limited by what you believe in your thinking. And Satan will use those lies to keep you bound, impoverished, always in needs, always in wants, always in lack. And you're always going to wonder, why can I get ahead? I know God wants me to prosper. But as long as you hold on to everything in your hand... God can't do anything. So we have to be a generous church. 
And I see it, man, I, I see it where you're going to love each other. You're going to know by the Spirit. It's not going to be by hints where it's like, brother, I need my, my electric bill paid. Somebody will be praying in the Holy Ghost and be getting a hold of this message and say, Lord, how can I bless people? And the Holy Ghost is going to download who to go to, how much they need. And they're going to pay your bills. But you're also going to pay other people's bills. My wife and I, after we got married, we were sitting in a... I mean, I'm always, you know, there's only two other places that I go, but Pastor Rodney Howard Browns, that's where we came from. So we're sitting in the service during one of the camp meetings, and the Lord puts a number on my wife and I's heart to give to somebody. We just, like we're sitting there with the Spirit of God moving, and it's just boom. And it was thousands of dollars. I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it was, but it was like I saw the, those people, and we just knew. We didn't have to talk to each other. The same Holy Ghost told us how much they needed. And I looked over at my wife and I said, what's the number you get? <laughs> and she looked over at me and she said, she, she loves to give. So she's like, ah, it's, it's, it's this thousands of dollars. And I go, oh, that's what I got too. <laughs> oh my goodness. Like it wasn't a few hundred, it wasn't even a few thousand. It was a sacrificial seed. We could have used that money for something else, but instead we chose to, to and we were just sitting there. We weren't going, Lord, how can we bless somebody today? We were just sitting there in service. And with the Holy Ghost moving, thoughts began to come to us. And then we, we, we saw those people. We said, how much money do you need? And it was the exact number. I think it was only off by maybe, what, a couple? It was the exact number. They were believing God for their honeymoon and also believing God to pay off some of their wedding. They didn't have any money to, to, to have a wedding. They didn't have any money to go on a honeymoon. But I believe they got to go to Europe. I didn't want to give that, like naturally. No, no, you're good, you're good, you're good. I didn't want to give that naturally. But in my spirit, I knew what the Holy Ghost was telling me to give. And it breaks you, it breaks your flesh. It breaks your poverty mentality. But when you do that, God does something. I can't exactly explain it, it's something spiritual. Where, the, where he entrusts you with the anointing, a greater level of the anointing. He goes, I can trust you because money doesn't own you. And we were so, we, after that, man, it just felt good to give. We didn't have the money on our bank account anymore. We could have used it. But we gave, we obeyed God. And we just, we just, we felt so good. We were an answer to somebody's prayer. We both heard from God. See, and that last week I was telling you, you got to be spirit led. You're not need led. Amen. You're not sympathy led. Amen. There's a lot of needs on this earth. You can't meet all of them. But you can meet the ones that God has assigned you to meet. And so that's why we got to get to the place where, yeah, we're yielding to the Holy Ghost, but we're yielding to the Holy Ghost in our daily life where it's like, it's not just I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm, I'm, I'm working for a living. No, you're working so that you can be a giver. Giving comes before your living. Giving comes before your living. Giving comes before you're living. That's how Jesus lived his life. He said, I did not come to, to serve myself. I came to serve you. He said, I didn't come to love me and glorify me. I came to serve you, love you, and to give us his glory. 
His presence, His power, His anointing. That's the more valuable thing. That's the, but like I said last week, we can go anywhere in this earth. And through the law of generosity and through the law of obeying the Holy Ghost and being sensitive to Him, God will show up and He will show off and He will meet all of our needs. Why? Psalms 115, go there with me. Psalms 115. And so, you, you know, the teaching about giving is contrary to everything that we experience in life. It's contrary to our natural desires. We have an idea that we got to save, we have to invest, we have to plan, and all of those things are actually good. You can be spirit-led in all of those things and never miss it. And you should be spirit-led. But you can't hold on so tightly. When God says to give. Psalms 115, 11 says this. You who reverently fear the Lord. Do you fear God? In other words, do you love the Lord? All right. He says, trust and lean in to the Lord. He is your help and your shield. He's your entire help and your shield. In other words, He is your provider and He is your protector. You have to make up your mind that your job is not your provider and your protection. You have to make up your mind that your savings account is not your provider and your protector. There is only one source in your life. There is only one provider and protector. And his name is Jesus. When you have this mentality, it's easier to give. Because you know he can use multiple revenues, resources to get what you need into your hand. Because he is your total help. Your total protection. And when you fear him, like I said last week, he takes a personal responsibility for your welfare. You won't need Obamacare, Trump care, any kind of health care. The Lord will be your kingdom care. Why is this? Because the Lord is mindful of you. God can't get you off of his mind. He is obsessed with you. He is in love with you. All he desires to do is to get his blessing and his favor into your hands. And the Bible says, this is the Old Testament. The New Testament says, uh, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But in the Old Testament, it says, he will bless us. He will bless your house. He will bless your family. Verse 13, he will bless those who reverently and worshipfully fear the Lord, both small and great. It doesn't matter if you have a little in your hand. God will still increase it to more than enough. There's sometimes people say, I can't give because I just have a little. No, no, no. That's actually the greater opportunity for bigger miracles. Somebody that has a lot, they might have more. But sometimes the wealthy give the least. The wealthy actually trust in their riches to such the degree that it is their God. When the Bible says in 1 Timothy, he says, Timothy, instruct the wealthy to give and be generous and led by the Spirit. Oh man, I felt that one too. I like this message. My goodness. You want to know why? Because it's a key to freedom in your life. You think I'm just getting on you. No, no, no. I am refuting strongholds. I am casting down vain imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the true knowledge of God's increased system. And I'm taking your thoughts, your imaginations and bringing them into captivity to the obedience of the Holy Ghost. 
This is what Paul had to do all the time. He went into different cities. He had to take people that knew nothing about the Bible and he had to combat their stinking thinking with the Word of God. But the Word of God broke them free. And it got them to a point where, of course, you know, we, we know his ministry increased. But many were blessed. Many increased because he fought for the truth. He fought for the truth. He didn't let people stay where they were and just tell them a nice little story on Sunday mornings. He gave them the truth. And as they continued in the truth, the truth set them free. He says this in verse uh, 14. May the Lord give you increase. Now, I like what it says in the King James Version. The Lord will increase you more and more. You and your children. All right, we get happy right there. But it gets better. You are blessed of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Verse 16 in the King James Version says, The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. And get this. See, whenever you think, Oh, I just don't have enough. The earth has He given to you. He didn't give you just like a street corner. He didn't give you just like a small town and community. He didn't give you a city the size of Miami. He didn't give you a state. He didn't give you a country. He didn't give you a particular ocean. He said, all of the earth belongs to you. That's better than any kind of economy that any nation can produce. Because God Himself created the heavens and the earth. He created the earth specifically for you. And every resource you need, everything you have need of, want and desire is in this earth. And it's already yours. So why are you afraid to give? Why be fearful when the Lord will provide for you? And you want to know why? Because He loves you. It's as simple as that. He loves you. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, says this. I'll read it from the Amplified Version. I believe it's 1 Peter 5. It says in verse uh, 6. Actually, let's go up to verse 5. I like that in the Amplified Version because it really brings together these verses. Uh, Because God really emphasizes our pride here. And He tells us the reason why we can't trust Him is because we're prideful. That went over really good. Likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank, be subject to the elders, the ministers, the spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. And he said, all of you, clothe, apron yourselves, all of you with humility. Say humility. Humility. You know, it takes a lot of humility to obey God when it comes to giving. You have to humble yourself because you have to trust God. You no longer become your provider your shield, your protector. Because that money represents a lot in our life, doesn't it? It represents your hard work, your time, your sweat, your blood, your tears. It represents years of education. It represents your family. It represents taking care of your baby's needs. It represents what you do with your retirement. It represents your entire life. That's why he says it takes humility to give because you're no longer putting your trust in yourself or your job you're putting it wholly in the Lord and that's right where he wants you completely trusting in Jesus dwelling so closely like like the apostle John at that point he was a disciple in the Passover meal John was the disciple whom Jesus loved man this guy got this revelation every time he addressed himself he said I'm the one that Jesus loves 
This was the young man, just a teenager, maybe 19, 18, somewhere in there. He made it a point at the Passover meal. I'm going to just be right next to Jesus. And the Bible says he got so close that he just hugged Jesus. He loved Jesus loving him. He trusted in his love and his care, his tender mercies to the point that John lived to 90 or 95 years old. He was the oldest living apostle. The man was dipped in hot oil, tried to be burned alive and they couldn't kill him. Because he believed that God loved him. That's why 2020 is going to be a year. It's going to, I believe it's going to be called the more excellent way. The year of the new commandment of love and a year of abundance. For our church, I ain't talking about the body of Christ. This is our portion of the body of Christ. But he says this, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility. You know, humility isn't something that your flesh has on it. You got to put it on yourself. And he goes, he describes what humility is. It's a garb of a servant. It's a garb. Serve one another. Respect one another. Treat each other with kindness and a temperament and patience. Do things with grace with each other. Because you have to remember your brethren and your sister in Christ are God's sons and daughters too. You don't know what your brother and sister is going through. You don't know what kind of pain's going on behind their, their, their closed doors, behind these church walls. And your act of grace and love, that kind handshake and just say, I love you in the love of the Lord, could have been the one thing that they needed for the day. See, your entire life becomes a gift where it becomes a sacrificial offering to be used by God so that you can allow God to love people through you. Ah, my goodness. Love like Jesus loves. Serve like Jesus served. He says this, so that its covering cannot be stripped from you. Don't let anybody take humility from you. Be completely free from pride and arrogance towards one another. Don't think you're better than one another. For God sets himself against the proud. God does not do anything with the proud. He sets himself. And he goes on to say what the proud is. It's the insolent, the overbearing, the presumptuous, the boastful. He opposes those people. He frustrates. He defeats them. But he gives favor and blessing to the humble. How many of you want favor and blessing in your life? Then just say, Lord, I'm going to be humble. <laughs> I'm going to be a servant when I want to be selfish. I'm going to give when you tell me to give, even if it hurts. But that's okay. My flesh needs to be put under. And he says this. He goes, humble yourselves. He, he, he goes now, he's emphasizing, humble yourself. Humble yourself. He's not done yet. He goes, demote, lower yourself in your own estimation. Stop thinking so highly of yourself that you're the source, that you're the provider, that you're the protector of your life. Get over yourself, so to speak. Amen. Why? Why? Now, I'm not saying don't work hard. I'm not saying don't take care of your family. But it's your mindset here. It's your attitude. It's your spiritual uh, countenance that you're giving off to people. You just think you're better than other people. You think you're better than God. Can you? That's what pride does. That's how deceiving pride is in the body of Christ. When we are trusting in ourselves and not in God, in our thinking, now not in actuality, we actually elevate ourselves above God, the creator of heaven and earth. And we think we're capable of things that we're not capable of. Well, you're setting yourself up for a fall. Amen. I know this is hard stuff. I know this is hard stuff, but it's the truth. 
And we have to, look, my, me included, we have to humble ourselves. He goes, under the mighty hand of God. That in due time, He may exalt you. Watch this, watch this. How do we humble ourselves? Verse 7, casting the whole of your care. Whew. Why are you so prideful? Because you're taking all the cares that God's supposed to have. All of your anxieties, all of your worries, all of your concerns, once and for all, cast them on Him. For He cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Now, I came over to this scripture just for that one verse right there. That it says that He cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Because God thinks about you all the time and He has the best plan in store for your life. But I forgot completely about the rest of it. We got to humble ourselves. You can't do what you want to do. Your life is not your own. It's Jesus's. But here's the thing. When you cast your care over on him, you say, I take the cares, the worries, the anxieties about my finances, about my relationships, about, you know, my future, about my ministry, about my business, about my family members that are gone crazy. When you cast those cares, you think you're being responsible. But God says you're not qualified to care for those things. You're not strong enough. You're not the great helper. You're not the great provider. You're not the great protector. In other words, you're not God. So just humble yourself. Take the worries, the cares. You know how hard it is to carry the worries? You know how stress-inducing that is to the point that you think you're going crazy? People go from cares, worries, anxieties, straight into depression. Before they know it, they have suicidal thoughts. Why? Because their entire mind is revolving around themselves. They have gotten their eyes off of the great helper, the great provider, the great shield of their life, the great caretaker, the one that watches over them affectionately and wants to take care of their every need. But he can't do it when we're... We got all that care in our hands and we're carrying it. And you know, people will be proud about their worries. They do, right? You know who's proud about their worries? The people that always talk about it. Sometimes I feel, boom. You guys see Evander Holyfield's son last night? He's 22 years old. Evander Holyfield's son. You guys know he's the world champion, you know, the heavyweight champ or the heavyweight boxing. His son comes out last night. He's in, a, I think, a welterweight class. He's 22 years old. The kid is flipping fast and strong. You know, you know this kid has the genes in him. Like, he is definitely a Vander Holyfield's son. And he's been trained properly. The dude that he was fighting against, in 16 seconds, he knocked him out. The referee called the fight. People were like, why'd you call the fight, ref? What'd you do? That guy should have given it. You should have given him a chance to fight him. No, no, no. When you, when you watch this man and his demeanor and his intensity, his training, his strength, his quickness, you go, I'm running for the doors, man. <laughs> Forget it. Game over. Time, time's up. I'll, I'll ring the bell myself. <laughs> See, some fights you're just not called to fight. Your cares, your worries, your anxieties, your fears. You're not called to fight them. You're called to just say, here, Lord, you fight it for me because only you can take on a Vander Holyfield son. That's it. But you see, us trusting the Lord has a lot to do with us humbling ourselves and saying, you're God in my life. You're the Lord of my life. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. And when you obey him, there's this, just the freedom takes place. Where you're not, there's a heaviness, there's a weight, there's oppression and depression that just lifts. And you'll have peace of mind. You'll have joy in the spirit. You'll really be a different person. 
lot of people are messed up because they're just trusting in themselves. When you need to be trusting in the Lord who watches over you affectionately, who cares for your every care. Let's see if I can find it in my notes. <clears throat> Where is it, Lord? There's a little bit more to that, and then, and then we're done. We, well, there, there's, there's two more points, and then I'm done. And I think I'm going to get out by 12.05. <laughs> Where is that, Lord? Praise the Lord. We, we won't go there right now because I had a number of scriptures here. Go with me to J Matthew, the sixth chapter and the tenth verse. You see, God personally wants to exalt you and promote you. He doesn't want anything on this earth. He doesn't want any man, any company, any business to promote you. He wants to be the very cause of all increased blessing, abundance, and promotion in your life. And when you have other people attached to you that are trying to make you who you're supposed to be, you're on the wrong road. If God is not your total source of supply, it's going to fail. That goes with everything in our life. Because if you think about it, our entire life is about, like we're always giving. Whether you want to or not, you're giving your taxes away, you're, you're paying your bills, you know, you're putting f uh, fuel in your car. You're always giving. I mean, just... You're taking in, you're giving out. You're always giving. You were really created to give, but don't give to the world system. Don't be held in snare to the world system and the world's ways. Give like God wants you to give and He will exalt you. Amen. Okay, Matthew 6.10 says this. We're up there. <clears throat> All right, simple verse. Your kingdom come, right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, so to answer this question... Is it a prosperity gospel or is it a poverty gospel? And we're going to continue on this. I began, you know, just going through some scriptures last night about heaven. And I, 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 I mean, I already knew this, but when you see it in the word, it does something for you. It builds faith in your spirit. What does heaven look like? What's going on in heaven? What's the economy like? What's the presence like? What, what is the atmosphere like? What, what are the homes like? What are the professions like? What's the service like in, in heaven? What does heaven revolve around? He says right here, Lord, I'm praying your kingdom come, your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Heaven is a perfect picture of what God wants to take place in your life right here on this earth. He didn't say you have to wait until you get back to or get up to heaven to experience it. You can experience right here, right now. So, I, I, you know, I, I just wrote these things down. Number one, everyone is blessed. No one's cursed. There's not one person who is mildly cursed. Everyone is blessed, prosperous, and healed. There is no needs in heaven whatsoever. Another thing, God's throne is there. His presence, presence fills the atmosphere. There's joy, there's peace, there's love. And it's being experienced all the time. There's no cares, no worries, no anxieties, no fears. There's riches beyond description. And I'm not just talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the way that God designed heaven and built heaven with 
gold and silver and all these different jewels. There's rewards for those who are faithful. There's treasures in heaven. The reason why on this earth, heaven and God's plans and purposes is worth investing in is because the return of treasures is just, I mean, it's out of this world. When you put God's kingdom first, God's things first, He takes a personal responsibility to bless you so that you can have heaven on this earth. Okay, all the power of Christ over the universe, that's where His throne is, that's where His power is. It's right there in heaven. That's the emanating place, the source of it all. No one perishes in heaven. No one dies in heaven. There's eternal life. There's nothing that doesn't get done in heaven. Whatever God's will is in heaven gets done. Somebody does it. There's no impossibilities. There's no questions. There's no why can't this happen. Okay, there's mansions in heaven. There's nice homes in heaven. There's a good land in heaven just for you that God's preparing. But He wants you to have a nice home here on this earth as well. But you see, this is where the prosperity gospel has gotten out of whack. People think it's all about me and my wealth and my increase. No, no, no. You don't get that unless you become generous like Jesus. Until that wealth and those riches mean nothing to you, then God can give it to you. The greatest gift that's ever given to humanity has come from heaven. Jesus and the Holy Ghost, the kingdom of God. There's perfect peace, perfect love, perfect light. There's never a loss in heaven, never a lack in heaven. No sickness, no addictions, no problems, no dilemmas, no delinquencies. It's not like this earth. It's not like the people on this earth. The people in heaven are different. It's the complete opposite. And God says He wants your life to exemplify heaven on this earth. That's His will for you. Whatever is in heaven, that's His will for you on this earth. you got to get that into your thinking. Because people, sometimes people will give, but then they don't believe God for more and for increase. They don't know how to receive. They think they're being humble. But they're not. They're being prideful. Because they're not totally trusting God with their giving. I could drop a pin in here, man. <laughs> but you see, God has designed an kingdom economic system for you so that all of your needs are met. You never lack one good thing. Everything in your life is well. In fact, that's one of the definitions of prosperity. All is well. All is well. You've got to speak that over your life. All is well here. All is well with my family. All is well with my profession. All is well with my car. All is well. And the Lord is increasing me more and more. Your increase never stops. There is no end to what God wants to do in your life abundantly wise. This day does not become a lacking day. It does not become, well, I got some issues, I'll just deal with it. Every issue in your life is an opportunity for you to bring heaven on this earth. For God to move in your life and bring heaven into it and make it just like He wants it for you. Well. Well. Well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my body. It is well with my finances. It is well with my family. It is well with my church. It is well with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is well. It is well. People have a sickness mentality, a poverty mentality in their mind, and it has to be broken because God does not want you living below your means. 
He wants everything to just be, well, well. I see wellness all over you. I see knees being made well, hips being made well, bank accounts being made well, backs being made well, spinal columns, the nerves in the spine being made well. I see legal situations being made well, family members being made well. Every problem we have in our life is actually an opportunity for God to make it well. That's why I want to preach on this. That's why I want to preach on money. Because I want things to be well with you. And I know what's going to happen. The spirit of generosity and giving by the Holy Ghost is going to break out in this place. People are going to be led by the Spirit to give to this church, to give to you, you give to others, and there's going to be a breakthrough in the anointing. There's going to be a breakthrough in here. Because when He trusts you with riches, then He gives you the big stuff. Amen. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait until your heart melts with love to just be generous. There's nothing off limits. There's nothing off limits. There's nothing off limits because my God, it has no limits. If I take the limits off of me and my giving, my God can give limitlessly to me. My God, my God. But you see our pride, what does it do? It builds a wall between us and God. He sets himself against us. So actually what we think is helping our life, when we don't tithe, when we don't give our offerings, when we are not led by the Spirit in our giving, what we think is actually helping us by keeping something that belongs to God, it's actually brick by brick. You're building that wall between you and the blessing of the Lord. Tear it down. Take the sledgehammer of faith and say, not today, devil, not today, money. You are not my God. My God is my God. And just to reiterate, I'm not putting any pressure on anybody to give. I want you to be led by the Spirit. I want you to hear from God for yourself. Obey God for yourself. <clears throat> because that's when the breakthrough is going to come. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Can I have you guys stand and, and we'll, we'll pray real quick. We'll make a declaration. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Just say this. Say, Father God, Father God I, love I love you. I love you with all my heart, my soul, my strength, my finances, my wealth, with possessions, time, effort, I love you with everything that I have. And I choose to love my neighbor as I love myself. Lord, help me to become generous, to see that generosity is the way you want me to live. Flood my spiritual eyes with light so that I can see how powerful and life-changing this really is. Help me along the way. Be patient with me, Lord. I know you are because you love me. But teach me over time how to be a giver and a proper receiver of your blessings because I desire the anointing. I desire the Holy Ghost to increase His presence, His power, His glory, His wisdom in my life. 
I surrender to you, Jesus. This church is going to be generous. It's already been generous. But we're going to a new level of generosity. We will go on special assignments to bless other ministries, families, communities, other nations. We will give. According to the Spirit's leading, but that giving will open doors in those cities and nations for the gospel. We will change nations, cities, and communities by our generosity. The Lord will do it, but He'll do it through you. Because He'll get the seed into your hand that you believe Him for. He'll get all the seed that you need. He'll put it into your hand, and you'll be a liberal soul. You will personally take care of God's needs on this earth, His people in His places, His churches. And then He will personally take care of everything that you have need of. For it is far greater that the Lord be on your side. It is far greater that the Lord be with you and in you and for you than anyone else, any economy, any lies of the enemy about the economy against you. Do not trust, do not trust in what man can do for you. Trust the Lord. Holy. Holy. Not halfway. Not three quarters. Trust Him fully. Because He then you'll be completely in His hands. You can't have one foot in God's hand and another on this earth. This earth cannot promote you. Only God's hands can raise you up and put you in the position and the status that He has called you to and foreordained you before the foundation of the earth. Only His hands can raise you and bring you before great men. But when you bow down and surrender in humility completely, oh, the lifting starts. The lifting starts. And it comes swiftly and it comes quick, quickly. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For it is far better to give than it is even to receive. Because you make a way for the Lord to completely take care of you. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Right now, just lift your hands, close your eyes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You minister to your people. You love on your people, Lord. You know, last night, uh, I felt something that I hadn't felt in a long time because I've been meditating on this love thing. And I heard about somebody that is messing up. At least I think they're messing up. And the Lord, the Lord just rose up on the inside of me and he, he, it was like, I love, I love them. 
I don't want one thing bad to happen to them. I don't want them to miss it. I don't want them to delay. I don't want them to go without any good thing. That's why I want them to turn. That's why I want them to walk in humility and serve me and make me them, make them or make me their Lord because then I can personally promote them. But if they go down that path, it will not be well with them. For I've not chosen that path. I've chosen a different way, a higher way, a more excellent way that is above the troubles and the, and the, the problems of this world. It's a high way to success, saith the Lord. Choose the high way. Choose the more excellent way. Choose the way of faith and love. Choose the way of generosity. Choose the way of humility. For God will promote you. He is faithful to His Word. And He will not let you down. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Now just hold, hold, hold just for a second. Now the altar is open. Come reverence the presence of God. If you have to go, go. But just keep on loving on the Lord in this place. Let Him continue to minister to you if you feel like that's you. If, if you have to go, go. I'm going to go. So, but now it's between you and the Lord. I did my job. Amen. We love you. We care for you. We want the best for you. Whew. Have a well week. Have a week of increase and more than enough. Every day. Not just one day, every day. In Jesus' name, amen.